both engaged in the Millennium Assessment where we were trying to point out the importance of ecosystem services. And I think the other side of that coin is a lot of the stress we do place on the environment doesn't buy us much in terms of human well-being and we need to disentangle that a little bit. So, I, I want to build on Dr. Three ideas that you started with. You said Lynn Ostrom points to markets, policy, and community management as three major drivers of how, how change can occur. Uh, I would add a fourth, and that is technology. The, the way that we do things, the way that, you know, so. Uh, and, 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 and all of these are connected. Um, I, let me first say, why isn't phosphorus on the radar? I mean, to me, this is this is the first phosphorus talk that I've been to uh, in. Uh, I think it's the first phosphorus talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and, and so you know, we've been thinking of a lot of other important environmental issues that affect ecosystem services through different different media, um, and and so why why is phosphorus seemed to be unimportant, um, and and I guess part of that. Now some of these things come in, in into fashion and we learn things scientifically and that brings things onto the radar. Uh, but in terms of decision making uh, in, in food and agricultural systems, I think part of the answer is that uh, phosphorus is cheap. I mean, Steve, you, you, you said that you thought food price rises in 2007, 2008 may have been partly due to the eightfold rise in phosphorus prices. But most of the economic studies out there link it to changes in diets, uh, in more, and, and changes in, in bioenergy policy, uh, much, much more than, than individual fertilizer inputs. And, 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 and then certain, you know, special, yes, special events. So, so that, then that, so, so if phosphorus normally, uh, phosphorus prices are, are very low and, and not that important, then there's this question, well, is phosphorus priced right? And what does it mean for something to be priced right? Um, in, in a, so, prices are the results of supply and demand, and sometimes, and, and there's supply and demands for marketed products. That's, you know, that's where prices work pretty well. And interestingly with phosphorus, we have, you know, we have food products. So, those, those do, to some extent, embody phosphorus prices, but phosphorus values. And then we have other things like uh, uh, algal blooms, where we are not very effective at, at building those into incentives that, that would involve pricing. And so Joan Rose raised an interesting question about initiatives in, in the direction of, uh, of, of local markets for phosphorus. And, and these are, there have been some attempts at that. They have not worked out too well so far. They've mostly been trades between, attempts for trades between point sources like sewage treatment plants or individual factories and non-point sources like farmers. But there are all these legal issues involved. If I as a farmer begin to trade phosphorus, you know, phosphorus reductions on my farm, then I invite people to monitor what's happening on my farm and I kind of open the door to a, a a level of scrutiny and, and a level of responsibility for a particular input that that could hamper my, my flexibility in the future. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of room for important innovation and policy, but I guess I wanted to I, I wanted to raise a couple points about phosphorus pricing, because you've made me think phosphorus is probably way underpriced in spite of the you know, the, the fact that right now it's four times as high as it was five years ago. So what happens when prices go up? People find a way to, people adjust in various different ways. And if, if you think of the, the three R's of environmentalism, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, all three of those R's happen when prices go up. Uh, far, you know, prices of inputs go up, farmers reduce amounts that they apply, and they think much more carefully about whether they need to apply them. Uh, reuse. Steve, you were telling me this afternoon about uh, new manure processing plants in, in Wisconsin that are putting out concentrate manure cakes that have concentrated phosphorus in them. It's a way to move phosphorus from one place to another, 
move phosphorus from you know, high supply regions to, to demand regions. But you need a certain, certain price for phosphorus for that kind of thing to work. Otherwise, you can't, you know, you can't support the processing exercise. Uh, and then, uh, and, and okay, so we've got reduced consumption and, and, and recycling. Uh, so I think in the short term, those actually are, those kinds of things could work more readily than some of these more complicated market trading systems, many of, some of which have been tried for, for 20 years and, and with, with difficulties. Although part of this gets back to institutional issues of, of the willingness to create property rights that don't currently exist, like property rights for uh, lakes with a low probability of algal blooms, and, and then be able to trace back the scientific linkage where you can then tie these things into markets through policy. But I, I guess my, my thoughts were that uh, what you said about high phosphorus prices is probably the first step toward uh, a virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you want to say a few comments before we open the floor? Uh, just briefly, I, I thought both of you made really great comments, and, and thank you for the thought you put into that. And, uh, 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 and I very much agree that phosphorus is seriously underpriced, and, and we need to do something. To, to get the price set higher to, to improve the situation. Uh, just one sort of ironic connection I wanted to make uh, to, the, to the Wisconsin phosphorus uh, processing situation is uh, we, we have these digesters that we're developing in, uh, and there's one that works now, and there's another one being built, and there's a plan to add many more to the watershed around Madison. These digesters are uh, essentially small sewage treatment plants that serve about five farms each. And the manure is uh, uh, fermented in the plant. It produces methane, which is, which act, and the methane that's produced in the plant actually provides all of the energy needs for the plant, plus more that's sold back to the grid. So these things are net energy producers. And they produce this very light phosphorus cake that you can take to a phosphorus deficient place and spread it around. Uh, so they have a lot of promise. One interesting thing we've discovered just in the past year is that uh, uh, natural gas uh, prices are going down because met uh, natural gas production is up. And so there is less of an economic bonus from the electricity, that, or from the, the methane that they're selling back to the power plant. And uh, of course, this is all subsidized by government, so the county is stepping in to stabilize it. But if they were running this as a business, the fluctuations in the natural gas price would be affecting their ability to take the phosphate out of circulation. So it's an interaction of you know, really two markets. Simply a problem that would have to be overcome. And if phosphorus were worth more, you wouldn't have to rely as much on the natural gas. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, Pat, over. Questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that raising the price of the phosphorus, and then hopefully that would keep starting and work the virtuous cycle, right? Do you think there is a possibility that that could actually have a negative social impact in the sense that? Increased phosphorus that causes the food production, whatever, to go up, and people instead of doing that recycling, we'll just, we'll just kick up the price of our milk or our food and have that reverberate, reverberate down the social chain, like lower in, lower um, poor communities and so on. Yes, that is always possible. Absolutely. What we're supposed to do? Okay. Uh, <laughs> does this make a difference? <laughs> uh, so yes, it's it's always possible that these things, uh, you know, we have these multiplier effects. But right now, phosphorus makes up such a tiny proportion of food accounts for such a tiny proportion of food prices that I think you could have quite a large change in phosphorus prices with a very 
small change in global food prices. Now, if you go to areas of the world that are, you know, where soils are phosphorus scarce, and I'm, I, you know, we have soil scientists in the room, and, and I'm not one of them, but, uh, you know, a lot of the growth, Steve showed a lot of the growth in phosphorus demand coming from Africa. There are large parts of Africa that are phosphorus scarce, um, and where soils are short of phosphorus, and in places like that, there, you know, more phosphorus is needed if we're going to raise productivity, and, and, and those are the kind of places where rising phosphorus prices would be problematic. Uh, or at least from my point of view, that's, that, that's where I think there would be, you know. And there too, you have people with low incomes who would be most hurt by rising food prices. So uh, I think it's less of a problem with rising food prices as not as much increase in, in yield gain because, not, you know, because of reductions in fertilizer supply. So, you know, ideally these things get coupled with policies that that can address some of the, the, the food consequences along with a policy that, that improves environmental outcomes. Yes, I think to follow up on phosphorus, we need a couple of three tiers perhaps of phosphorus pricing, much like pharmaceuticals. Okay, where malaria is high, we should have lower prices for anti-malaria. And, and where we have high phosphorus, as you've shown on the map very nicely, we should have a much higher price on that phosphorus. Most, most of the time, farmers will adjust based on prices, but also on the high phosphate uh, contents in their soil. That, that's a comment. I have a question, though, with regard to these increases of 100-year uh, floods. Have, have you come across data that's correlating urbanization with increased frequency of floods? Look at Bangladesh, look at some of our own increases, 2, 3, 4% of arable land that normally absorbs water is turned, being turned in on an annual basis to, you know, asphalt, shopping centers, et cetera. Have, could you make a few comments? Yeah, well, in, in urbanizing watersheds, that is certainly a factor. And in uh, the, the Madison, Wisconsin watershed where I work, we have looked very closely uh, at that. And the increase in floods is about half urbanization, half weather. So. There, there has been an increase in intensive storms, but we've also seen an increase in uh, urban uh, land cover. Globally, oh, I should be using this. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Globally, uh, urban land cover is is uh, urban <laughs> land cover is not very extensive uh, uh, globally, but certainly in you know in the urban areas. Mm -hmm. And just to, to follow that on, you pointed this out in the talk, in, in this region and some other regions around the world, what we're seeing is not so much an increase in overall precipitation as an increase, for example, in rainy days followed by rainy days, and that tends to overwhelm systems, particularly the urban systems, uh, which are not sized properly for where they're headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jan. So I'll, I'll kind of follow up on uh, the idea of needing phosphorus, different amounts of phosphorus in different places. And this is kind of drilling down into, uh, in, into details, but also kind of getting it trying to solve problems. So in this case where you have a greater need for phosphorus in phosphorus-poor soils, isn't it true that that phosphorus will not be released from those soils as readily and transported to freshwater systems? I, I, I am not a soil scientist, but uh, phosphor, it, first of all, most soils, when you put them in water, are going to release some phosphorus. And freshwaters are incredibly sensitive to small amounts of, uh, of, of phosphorus. The, uh, uh, a common threshold is 24 micrograms per liter. Uh, which is far less than the kinds of concentrations that you find in in uh, most soils. 24 micrograms per liter is the eutrophy mesotrophy boundary, and uh, uh, so I, I would be pretty cautious about that uh, statement. So yeah. I'll, I'll go in the other direction this time on scale. 
Are there any parallels between uh, how policy and, and the, the so carbon uh, 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 climate change issues are managed at an international scale? And we think of because it's globally trans transported and, <coughs> and, and, and Chinese emissions, our emissions have effects to our planet. So you would manage that at an international scale. It's an international issue. Is phosphorus an international issue? Um, that, I think that's an interesting question. The, the United States, for example, uh, would realize several benefits from getting our internal pricing right for phosphorus. Uh, we have huge freshwater pollution problems, which would be mitigated if we got phosphorus price right. Um, and we would that would incentivize conservation and probably innovation in phosphorus management, which would give us a buffer against things that might happen in Morocco to cause instabilities in the global market. So I, I would invite you guys to expand on this if I'm going the wrong direction, but uh, I, I think we could unilaterally, as a, as a country, use a tax or some other instrument to get phosphorus price right and realize a lot of benefits internally without manipulating the global situation much at all. I'll just add a, 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 a thought there because it, and, 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 and you know, all honesty, this is not something that I've thought about carefully, so I'm sort of doing this on the fly, which is risky with an audience. Um, <laughs> but, it might be, I mean, to me, the interesting, an, an interesting aspect of, of, of phosphorus is that you have uh, some environmental effects that are relatively local in scale. So, you, you know, at the watershed scale, uh, where, where phosphorus moves into water and moves into local bodies of water. And so, so we have kind of local scale for, for that environmental endpoint. But we have global scale for globally traded foods, uh, you know, grains and so forth, and, and fertilizers. And so I could almost imagine, I mean, I think it would be interesting to consider a, a, a two-part, uh, two, two pieces to thinking about phosphorus prices. So you've got this sort of nutrient price that is one that's driven by, uh, by cost of production in Morocco and elsewhere uh, and, and, uh, and food, food values as, as they get you know, mediated in the market. And then you have some, maybe some local taxes or something that are based on the, the local impacts of phosphorus being used in that particular place. Because just as there are parts of the world that are phosphorus scarce, your map did show a few parts of the United States that do not have abundant phosphorus. And it's, you, one could imagine some movement of where things get produced. In the United States, part of the movement of the uh, contract hog industry has been driven by state level regulations in, in uh, manure management. And, and not necessarily driven in good directions, but these things do happen. And if we, if we had some kinds of local taxing or, or something that affected phosphorus prices that tailored it to local outcomes, that might shift where and how phosphorus gets used. And I just follow up, following up on that point. Because, of, granted, the greenhouse gases are well mixed globally, so it's a global problem. But given the failure of national policy, a lot of us are pointing out that we have what we sometimes call a Jeffersonian experiment going on in the United States, that there is U no U.S. national policy. There are an awful lot of state and local both mitigation and adaptation policies, and this gives us a real chance for social learning. If we're paying attention and studying these things carefully, we can learn a lot about what works, and I think the same, the same applies. Uh, the other thing I, I would uh, um, wonder about with regard to the price mechanism is if it's such a small part of the, the total price of food, um, to what extent has, what's the elasticity? When those price rises went up, was there really a sharp reduction in phosphorus use? And if not, we may have to work, we're not going to be able to drive the phosphorus price high enough um, by taking account of externalities to actually get any change in behavior. So we may have to look at other mechanisms or this complementary mechanism. Um, and also, well, that's a different issue. I mean, one thing we find with, with energy use is that, that there's just a lot of misunderstanding of what's actually using and wasting energy. 
And so people don't respond to price signals very effectively because they do the wrong thing when they respond to the price signals. So it's always, it gets back to my earlier point, it's always a mix of approaches that works best. Do we have a question here? Oh. You kind of just said exactly what okay. I was thinking. Uh, you know, just I, I question how much of a driver phosphorus could be in at a local level when it is such a small part. And don't you think if it ever got to the point where uh, it did affect people's lives that government would start to subsidize it, just like we do with our other resources, like car, uh, oil and that type of thing, which is arguably less elastic? Yeah, I guess the way I think about it sometimes is how do you set up an institution so people actually respond to prices and then you get the prices right? <laughs> but in this case, you have to be careful that you're doing that. You're not trying to, because there's an impact on food for the poor, you got to be careful about that part of it. And farmers' livelihoods and things like that. Question? Um, I visited a nearby, uh, one of the trading commissioners uh, nearby here recently talking about water quality, and he said we should ban phosphorus. And I have no basis for knowing that. Well, first, first of all, there's a tremendous amount of phosphorus in circulation already. Um, I, I did a calculation one time that uh, if, we, there, if we stop adding, absolutely stop adding fertilizer uh, to the watersheds around Madison, it's still 20 years or so uh, be before we would begin to see any impact on crop production and begin to see impact on the lakes. So there, there's a lot of it out there in, in circulation. Second of all, it actually is an essential nutrient. I mean, if, if, if your personal phosphorus intake dropped to zero, in a month you'd be pretty sick. And um, so it, it's a substance we need in circulation. I mean, it's kind of like oxygen, right? I mean, too much oxygen and things blow up. But we're, we're not going to ban oxygen. <laughs> I think mean, phosphorus is, is the same. We, we've got to find a way to live with it and use the right amount of it. Yes? Sort of slightly related. So you were saying that right, in relation to the situation in the, in the, the Sahara, people, all these, com these strategic conferences are getting together. Of course, that's what we do. We think about how we can send the military to get what we need. But I was, I, what I thought you were going to say is people were looking at this as a strategic opportunity to actually figure out, you know, think, think about, about ways to deal with this uh, situation, given that there's a double-edged sword that, you know, we need it, but we don't want too much of it. We better start thinking about how we can be using less in certain places, blah blah blah. So I was curious if yeah, con con about con that. Conser conservation is definitely a part of a strategic conversation that's that that's going on. And I, I mentioned those strategic articles <coughs> simply to make the point that phosphorus <coughs> is now being considered, you know, as a policy issue that cuts across a, a number of of areas of governance. And just and climate change is being considered as a strategic issue, of course. Uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, you think about climate change. You can, I always like to think about that in relation to um, uh, ozone. You know, the world got together, figured out there's a couple of uh, key sources of ozone that are causing problems, or, or not ozone, but uh, anyway, <laughs> and um, and figured out a way to deal with it. And car carbon is so much more complicated. And we wave our arms a lot, we talk a lot, and nothing really happens. And I, you know, it'd be interesting to know where if phosphorus falls on closer to one side of that spectrum than the other. Well, you know, one of the amazing things to me is one, one, one reason that phosphorus doesn't get any respect in ecology <laughs> is, it, is it has a really simple cycle. It's an incredibly simple mineral cycle. And everybody wants to work on nitrogen because it has five redox states. <laughs> <laughs> it does it does, inbox, it does really cool reactions. The microbes do this stuff. They love it. <laughs> and, they, and they ignore phosphorus, you know, because it's simple. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you know, it, it hasn't been solved for all the reasons we've, we've been discussing here. I, I think it, in principle, it seems to me like it ought to be a simpler problem than a climate problem. 
Not as simple as ozone. But not as simple. Yeah, in the case of ozone, it's uh, you know there was there were substitutes immediately available that the companies had ready to make that didn't cause the problem, and the companies were ready to deal. Uh, and uh, it you know the, the thing just happened. Phosphorus isn't quite that simple because you have to use it in this widely distributed way. I have a question while the rest of you are pondering further questions. So this clearly is a very interdisciplinary problem given the three of you standing or sitting at the table there. I guess I'd like to start with Steve but have each of you answer sort of from your disciplinary perspective. What, what are the major uncertainties or what, what are the unknowns here? Is this mainly a sociological problem? Like how are we going to deal with sort of governance issues and the economics of it? Or are there clear research needs that there's aspects, for example, Steve, of the phosphorus cycle that we fundamentally don't understand? Or is it, as you say, very simple, we understand it, and that's, we, we don't necessarily need new research to sort of figure this out? Well, uh, I, I, I think that it is an institutional and economic problem uh, along the lines of Tom's comment a while ago that uh, if you get the institutions right, then you can get the pricing right and then things work. Um, I think the research need is on local ways of managing phosphorus. So the local, what are the local instruments, policy instruments and technologies that work to manage Phosphorus. I, I uh, uh, for you know, for example, uh, how do you get farmers to manage it the right way once you figure out biophysically what the right way is? Uh, uh, and then, are there technologies that we really could be developing and using that are underdeveloped now? I think manure digesters are an example of one that is, that is coming online now. I, I think we'll probably get better and better at manure digesters, but are there other tools like alum immobilization of phosphorus or uh, other biological tools we ought to be using? So I think in the innovation end, there's research needed on uh, uh, biophysical technologies and, and policy instruments for deploying those. Uh, I guess getting back to your original question, yeah, it's an interdisciplinary problem. I think we need to look at the institutions, the economics, and the biophysical aspects of it together and get it right. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh -oh. uh, the, the only other thing I might throw in is that I think that as we're trying to look across the suite of, of risks we have to manage, um, we need a lot, a, a lot more research on what to use the jargon the drivers are. I mean, we kind of know at a first approximation schedule level the population to have consumption, the technologies we use, um, you know, the patterns of consumption, and so on. But I think we need to know a lot more about the details of those things than we do now. But that's a fairly once you get past that general sketch, it's, it's you know once you get past IPAP, basically, in fact, people's population that have lots of technology. We kind of know that, but we need to unpack that a lot to get at the leverage points. I mean, some of Jack's work on households that we know for a lot of environmental problems, people don't matter. It's the number of households that matter um, because that's what drives them. So, and that that's important because it indicates where the points of leverage are in, in terms of influence and change. I, I would add one thing about the our understanding of the system, and this is an anecdote from a current project that I have with the Nature Conservancy, looking at. Uh, the effects of cropland management decisions on algal blooms in the Great Lakes, uh, particularly Lake Erie, and the biotic integrity of, of, uh, of streams. And so there, there, this is an exercise where we're linking aquatic ecology models to overland flow models, to crop management decisions, uh, to the kinds of incentives that, are, that, that influence behavior by, by farmers. And Part of, you know, part of what strikes me is the tremendous amount of uh, variability and, and the, the, the 
how much is not known about how phosphorus moves and the relative quantities of it in different places at a moment in time. Now, and maybe, maybe it's, so that this is not, you know, maybe if I were working with Steve, I'd know a lot more. But, <laughs> but with, the, with the, 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 the colleagues that I am working with, I, what we do know is that uh, crop management decisions, even in areas like the Maumee Basin, have uh, a fairly modest impact on this, at any moment in time, they have a very tiny impact on the stock of phosphorus in Lake Erie. Um, there are other things that influence algal blooms, and I, I feel as though to, to be able to think about institutional design and understanding markets well, we need to have a, a really good understanding of fate and transport, and the fact that the phosphorus cycle is simpler than nitrogen or carbon could be a plus in this respect. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, the safest place for phosphorus is in the soil if you have organic matter, if you have calcium. It won't move. It just simply will not move. The reason we're fighting eutrophication in some of the Great Lakes is the erosion of that soil. That's what's happening in Wisconsin as well. So what, what I think is so important is that we find concentrations that are ideal. Uh, I guess before you came to Michigan State, there were about eight or ten folks in this campus working with phosphorus just as, as they were at Madison. It was a huge process, and Gull Lake, of course, was truly a eutrophier of the worst process, and that's perfectly cleaned up now. Why? Because of human waste, primarily. It's no longer a drop, uh, it, it's no longer going into Gull Lake. So it's but not just soil, it's, it's also yeah. manure. Exactly, <laughs> okay. exactly. So, so it, there's a very high correlation now with the increase in phosphorus in our fresh waters, with populations, simply not only population of humans, but animals. And the manure question is, is, is one of the biggest reasons because it's so soluble. As soon as it gets into solution, we can have a pure clay with nearly saturated with phosphorus and less than 1% moves into the solution. So we, we have to be careful how we talk with the farmers. I think they've done very well. They put on too much because it was cheap. But very few farmers are adding phosphorus in the state of Michigan unless they get into sandy soils or sandy loam soils. And, or they have animal waste to dispose that's, of. That's true. And then they, then they, so it's the waste products of the fields. Um, I thought there was a really interesting way of thinking about efficiency of phosphorus in your figure. I think it was in the review where you know, have the inputs and the output arrows for phosphorus. Oh, no, that came out. Oh, that's it's out. It's in environmental research letters in December. Okay. I'll but I was wondering if, uh, how do you think, so that's a snapshot in time, how do you think that efficiency has changed over time for getting it into a human pool, but also what the main drivers are of that efficiency? I, I think that's a great question. I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I, I think it would be possible to do a back of the envelope pre-industrial calculation fairly easily. The trajectory would be harder to, to reconstruct. but. Maybe it could be done because we know, uh, certainly at the border, you know, at the border we would know exports and imports. So, great project. Somebody should do it. Let's get on. <laughs> yeah, we have folks on the use of uh, 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 for farming for food production. I think that's an important component. What percentage of this uh, use has been uh, uh, used by household or the uh, lawn man man management or other type of land? It's, it's a, a few percent. I mean, there certainly is some. Phosphorus is used in some industrial products. It's in most toothpastes, uh, things, things like that. But it's, uh, it's uh, really a, a few percent. It's, uh, the, the big environmental impact is through the agricultural sector. Just to clarify that, does that include uh, lawn turf fertilization? Yes, it does. Such an ag? No, no, no. Well, uh, it, it depends where you get. I, I, I would have to actually go back to original yeah. sources. But it's pretty small. Okay. It, uh, uh, I, I happen to know for the Ahara watershed, Four Lakes in Madison, Wisconsin, it's 3%. Is, uh, is the lawns, and uh, 
the rest of it is, uh, I think ag is 85 or something like that, and the, rest, the balance is construction sites. Any other final questions? All right, any final words you all would like to leave us with before we take a break and have a reception? I'll just say thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank <laughs> you.